CTV's W5. Here is Rick Westhead. Welcome back. He's the winningest coach in NHL history. Scotty Bowman has won more games and has more Stanley Cups than any other. An innovator, a master motivator, but also someone who wasn't afraid to make some enemies along the way, even among his own players. He's a hockey icon who, as you're about to see, even 50 years after breaking in with the league, can't stay away from the rink. This is hockey royalty, Scotty Bowman and Ken Dryden. You just look at all the names and you see the rocket. The most decorated coach in hockey history and a goalie that took the league by storm. And the Bruins are making changes while the play goes on, so are the Canadians. 14 Stanley Cups between them. And, uh, that's a Hall of Fame on that side. Wow. A visit to the Montreal Canadiens dressing room brings it all back. Well, you coached Doug Harvey. Yeah, that's right. And Dickie Moore. Yeah. And Jacques well, Plante. Henri. Henri. Not go. Frank. Yeah, Frank. Yvan, yourself, Jacques Lemaire. Ken Dryden and Scotty Bowman will be forever linked to the Montreal Canadiens in the mid-1970s. With Scotty behind the bench and Dryden in net, they won five Stanley Cups, including four in a row. What was the buzz around that team? Do you remember what Montreal was like, just the city, the, the, the following for them then? Well, the, the fans knew how good the team was. I think in Montreal, I was, I was probably uh, pushing as hard as I could with, with that team, but because the potential was so great, and, uh, and I mean, we had, we had four in a row, but the four seasons that we won, 76, 77, 78, 79, the, the, the seasons were pretty similar. We just kept winning and winning. Here's we had the like the offense, we had defense. Boy, what action we had, the Stanley Cup playoff game, coming to you from the Forum in Montreal. What was it like to be the coach of the Montreal Canadiens, local boy, walking down the street of Montreal during that time? Well, the pressure to win helped the team win, but I never felt the pressure. The odds were with us, so you know, you couldn't ask for any more. I wasn't interested in, in uh, promoting individualism as far as trophies, and what I tried to convey to the players was the individual trophies will come, but they'll come after the, after the team trophies. We knew that with him as our coach, we had a better chance of winning than anyone else did in the league. And there you have the articulate graduate of Cornell and McGill University, right in the Montreal. Ken Dryden was the backbone of the Montreal dynasty. Even though he only played in the NHL for eight years, he was there for all five cups, was the league's rookie of the year, and won the Conn Smythe Award as the playoffs' most valuable player. Now, Dryden has celebrated his former coach's life and times in a new book, Scotty, a hockey life like no other. Nobody has ever lived uh, a hockey life like he has. And, and I knew that. I, I had known that, oh, at least for the last 20 or so years. He had to earn his way at every stage. He was far, far from a sure thing along the way. And he, and he isn't this, this big personality guy of, of just being so charismatic that you, you know, he's, he's front and center and you've got to put him behind the bench and, and the media all love him because he's a story a minute. The media is much more patient with the great guy than the guy who has won before but is losing. Dave was a checker. Right. Bruce, he played for the National, didn't he? Later, uh, earlier. Dave did. Al Manier was brought in from, from the Maritimes to play there. And he played for Weston Duke. Played for Weston Duke. Uh, West Duke. Scotty, you know, didn't have, uh, you know, kind of a, a long leash really anywhere. And he, he had to make sure that he was winning all the way along. And he did. As I see it, the game is, is so fast. And the players have such short shifts that you, you'd, for changing on the fly, you'd be giving up a lot. You gotta be careful now. Scotty is an encyclopedia of hockey. When he's not thinking hockey, he's talking hockey. And Ken Dryden soaks it all up. Drafting Russian players in the 80s was, was really a, 
uh, you know, a, a chance that they may not never come. And they, they had to defect. It's so fresh for him. He is able to say and to believe and to know that every next moment might actually be different from every last moment. And so he's watching to see if it is or not. So he's 86 years old and he has absolutely the instincts, attitude, approach, and ability to learn and to be amazed like somebody who is 16 or 26. He made me a, a, a very good player, and uh, I'm in the Hall of Fame. They retire my jersey. On this group, I played sure. with everybody on this group, except uh, after my career. Serge Savard was also a huge part of the Canadians' dynasty in the 70s. Scotty Bowman was ahead of his time. He was thinking hockey all the time. He, he, had, he had all the tricks. Pro ball to Savard, and Savard makes no mistake and the play that won the game for Montreal. Roberts couldn't get the puck, but Savard did. One night against Detroit, we, we got beat pretty badly, and uh, I, I, I told the team, we, we didn't have curfew all the time, and I, I decided this night, I said, we're going to have a curfew. You, you went down the, the lobby at 10.30 with the hockey stick, and you give it to the bellman. And he said, could you get an autograph with all the players? <laughs> so he got the autograph of all the players that came after 11. I did know this guy, and I asked him, I got some players that might not be in at 12, and I gave him the stick, and he got all the autographs, and I gave him a good tip, and I brought the stick the next day. There was about four or five of them, and he not only caught them, but he put the time on when they came in. Players get mad at those things, but that was Scotty. Scotty was always as an edge. Bowman stepped into some big skates, replacing Toe Blake as coach of the Montreal Canadiens. Not bad for a hometown kid who grew up a Boston Bruins fan. Scotty grew up in the working class suburb of Verdun, not far from the buzz of game nights at the Montreal Forum. What do you remember about your neighbors? Who were the, the ones oh, that were? Across the street, 741, Mrs. Taylor, they came from England and her uh, husband, uh, Jack Taylor. I do remember having a newspaper route. I did the Montreal Star, which was an afternoon paper at the time. But I was able to fold them together, and if I had two or three upstairs, I would throw them upstairs. When you're back here now and you're looking around the neighborhood, what memories come to mind? What was this place like, the block to live on back at that time? Uh, I played softball and baseball, and the winter we played hockey all the time. And I spent my first 16 years living here. We had a house full of people, and it wasn't very big. It was about 850 square feet. But I, I, now that I look back on it, I, I realize um, why, I, why I liked sports so much is because we didn't spend much time in the house, just more or less to sleep, you know? And uh, right. I had a good life. We, we didn't miss for anything, I don't think. I'm proud that I came from Verdun. The old Verdun Auditorium is where Scotty scored his first goal. <laughs> The building still puts a smile on Scotty's face. Oh, look at this. They haven't been back here for decades. And even though the building is under renovation, it still brings back a flood of memories for Scotty and Ken. I suppose in the 40s and 50s, this was also a real gathering place for the community. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a good meeting place for the people who were proud of the auditorium. And when I Later on, when I came back to Canadians in uh, seven, uh, 1971, this was our practice arena. We used to dress up in the forum and uh, come down on the bus. It was a city bus, and we used to leave from Atwater and come down Atwater, and you had to stop at a light, and people would be running, and all of the Canadians were sitting with all, all the players with their... It was pretty good. Scotty was an above-average hockey prospect but his career was cut short by an ugly incident. I got injured when I was 17 by, by a foul play. Jean-Guy Talbot was a, was a good, an upcoming junior defenseman, and he was a year, I think a year or two older than me, and I got hit over the head with a stick, and I, I got injured enough that I, it really affected my, my, my chance to have a career, not my career, because it's only a chance, you're only 17. Well, Scotty eventually recovered from his injury, his playing days were done, his focus turned to coaching. In that era, coaches would, were usually ex-players that retired in their 30s and 40s, and I was in my 20s. So I got a good jump on coaching. 
coming up. He tests you, he confronts you. A singularly unique coaching style. He says, you can't do that to me. My family is here tonight. When W5 continues. It's hockey night in Chicago. Inside the United Center, Scotty Bowman is back to doing what he does best. His coaching days are over, but Scotty is a hockey lifer. He's now a member of the Chicago Blackhawks, working as a special advisor. He's also fulfilling a dream, working shoulder to shoulder with his son Stan, the general manager of the Hawks. Growing up as a little kid, I used to love to just sit at home and listen to him make phone calls and talk hockey. He would call his assistant coaches and they would talk about the game or they would talk about another game that was happening. Good, good drop. This is a pretty good cool. He can rip it, yeah. But he also takes rip it. Well, but he can, yeah, but he can also slap it. I've learned from my dad, the way you learn is you ask questions. His mind works at a different pace than everybody else and it's fortunate for us in Chicago to have his knowledge to draw upon, whether it's coaches or management or scouts. Is this the first goal case? Yeah. Everybody interacts with them, and I think they all feel smarter because of it. This is where Scotty spends his off seasons. His home in Buffalo is a testament to his success. His basement alone is a sports hall of fame. Here's Muhammad Ali. <laughs> That's the seat that my wife sat in when I was in Montreal. First time I went to the White House with Pittsburgh when Bob John, late Bob Johnson, his team, that's uh, George Bush, and then we've got uh, President Clinton. We got, I got a letter from Ronald Reagan. Back in 1985, when I won uh, my 692nd game, he said it was a career win, so that was a nice gesture, uh, coaching the Sabres. He's even kept his scouting books dating back to the early 60s. In fact, there's one I was noticing here. Uh, this is May of 1962. Bobby Orr, Huntsville. He must have saw him play a game. There's another one from Penetang to Miskaming. So as you'd be going up, we, we go by the date. Meals, meals and tips for the day, $6. I feel like the price of gas and per diems have gone up. You could fill a tank for $6. He was never considered warm and fuzzy as a coach. Fact is, many players hated playing for him. But Scotty lasted 2,100 NHL games. Why? Because players begrudgingly accept strong-arm tactics as long as they win. Even veterans like Serge Savard weren't immune to his techniques. My father was coming maybe once or twice a year in Montreal to see me play. We were from 400 miles northwest of Montreal. And and he knew my father was, was in the stand that game. And I walk in, in the dressing room and he says, you're not dressing tonight. He says, you can't do that to me. My, my family is here tonight. And I dress every game. I never missed a game. And he says, well, OK, well, one condition. You go take a cold shower. You haven't played well in the last few games. Scotty is not somebody who throws his arm around you and pats you on the back and, and uh, you know, blows smoke and all the rest. He doesn't do that sort of stuff. You know, he tests you, he confronts you. To work with Steve Jobs at Apple was not a whole lot of fun most of the time. And sometimes it was the same with Scotty. Why did the people at Apple stay with Steve Jobs? Well, they stayed with him because they knew that if they were around them, they'd do special stuff. How would you describe your relationship with guys while they played for you? I, I, uh, I don't know. I somehow felt there was two elements. There was the pro side and there was, and there was the personal side. And I, I mean, I was there to try to win. I read about the, the issues you had with guys like Dino Cicerelli, where he said, Scotty's a great coach, but he's a rotten person. <laughs> Did that wear on you? Did that grate you? And I, no, because I voted for him in the 
when he got in the Hall of Fame. I, I, I don't think you can carry any grudges. I mean, you, you do your job. And it's hard to one up him. It really isn't because he's Scotty Bowman. I, I respected him. It's like you respect people. But Scotty, like I said, he, he amused me. It was funny. Chris Chelios played an astounding 27 years in the NHL, including 10 years in Detroit with Scotty behind the bench. He says he got a kick out of Bowman's tactics. Looking back, he says he might have felt different if the ultimate goal wasn't winning. This is sarcasm, I guess would, I would say, that he used to motivate the players. But they won, you know, and they, and they looked back and they, they, they were thankful they got a chance to play for him. How important was it for Scotty, in his own mind, do you think, uh, to be liked by his players? What kind of relationship did he have with that? <laughs> I don't think he cared. Scotty coached five teams over five decades, and he was always able to stay ahead of the curve. Into the corner, here's Draper, ball feet to the front of the net, pass to him, oh. yeah! What a play! When he arrived in Detroit in the early 90s, he had a chance to revolutionize the way the game was played. I really enjoy Scotty's story in Detroit because it was such an interesting and different one. In Ken Dryden's new book, he describes the genius of Scotty Bowman, rewriting the playbook and completely altering a style of play. To Kozlov, scores! If you blinked, you missed it. Up until that time, that there might be one or two Russian players that were on an NHL team. And they were either ones that were disappointments or for the most part, they were phenoms. Goes to the backhand, drops to Verkaz, off a shot, he scores! Wow. Oh, that oh. line just wow. keeps working. Matt. The Red Wings didn't only have one Russian superstar. They had a handful, including three forwards and two defensemen that would come to be known as the Russian Five. Kozlov to Larionov. Went to Detroit, and Sergei Fedorov and, and Vladimir Konstantinov had been regulars, and Slava Kozlov was a, was a rookie trying to come in. When we got Fatisov and then we got Larionov, we had five of them. All of a sudden, a different kind of game. We put them together. I didn't do anything. I was like magic for, for the team. Coming late. The late man is what kills you in this game, and the Russians do it better than anybody. The five Russian superstars played as a unit, essentially playing a game of keep away. The Russians' idea of defensive hockey was what we did with the puck. They weren't very good when they didn't have the puck, but they had it most of the time. Chris Chelios got a front row seat for the Russian Revolution. The retired Hall of Fame defenseman says his former coach outsmarted everyone else by putting all five Russians on the ice at the same time. How would you describe how different he was from other coaches of his time? The biggest thing would have been bringing those five guys, you know, the Russians, and creating a whole new style of play for the wings just overnight, you know, to, to do that. And he, Montreal, when he was coaching, he had all the best players, the greatest players. So they, they, you know, as far as my, you know, my experience with him, what he did with those Russian guys bringing in to Detroit and, and turning it overnight, turning that organization around. The Russian Five contributed to three cups in 97, 98, and 2002. The third championship breaks Toe Blake's record of eight Stanley Cups. Scotty goes for a victory skate and then retires on the spot. Chris Chelios was on the ice. I was shocked and we just won the cup. It wasn't even a minute and a half after, you know, we won the, you know, the game was over. And all he did was skate around from player to player saying, I'm done, that's it. I'm not coaching him. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're done. I didn't even, I ignored him. I just go, what is he? And sure as heck, he, he quit. That was it. He's 86 years old now, but Scotty has hardly slowed down. So how's your brother doing in uh, Detroit? Good? Good. Yeah, he likes it. He, likes it. Yeah. he spends half the year in Florida and the other half at home in Buffalo. He watches every Blackhawks game and scouts future opponents. They play on Saturday? Yeah, the team plays Saturday and Sunday. He also never misses an opportunity to catch one of his grandkids on the ice. Scotty never stops watching. He even watches the kids play and really watches. It's not just that he's there. He's watching them with the same eyes that he watched Bobby Orr at 13 and with the same kind of sense of possibility, wonder, question, questioning, doubt, all the same 
unchanged over all of that time. What's his legacy in the game? Is his legacy a statistical one? It certainly could be. Really what I hope his legacy is, is that ability to be willing to see everything as if you don't know everything. With Scotty, he, he pretty much discards what he knew yesterday for what he's seeing today. And that's amazing. Ken Dryden's book, Scotty, A Hockey Life Like No Other, will be officially released on October 29th.